Hey, hey guys. So welcome to uh, Service Online with Chinatown Peace Church right here. And so uh, before we begin our, uh, I guess before we begin the worship, let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer. I'll say for us and then we start it off. Right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for this time that we can come and worship in your name and worship freely in your name. And God, we just pray for your spirit to be poured into us, that uh, we will feel your spirit and we can worship your name um, together here as a community at Chinatown Peace Church. So God, we, uh, yeah, we pray also for the message, the upcoming message, and pray that it be a, something that uh, we can apply to our lives and speaks to us as well. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's, uh, let's hit it.
scripture reading. So our scripture reading today is on Mark uh, chapter 14, verses 32 to, 40 to, to 42. Maybe I can read that and you guys can just follow along. So let's start it up. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Can you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And with Thanks this time, be to will, God. And with this time, I will pass it over to our guest speaker. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to just introduce Jenny. I'm so glad that uh, Jenny 
uh, has joined us for the beginning of the World Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. I might have gotten those words not quite in the right order, but we're just really honored to have Jenny here from 24-7. Jenny, we first met when you were with Servant Partners, right? Uh, servants, not Servant Partners. Servants. Yeah. Yes, That's okay, amazing. okay, right. <laughs> and uh, Jenny, uh, last time we met her was in the the combined service, I called it the joint service, but somebody said, yeah, joint service in the downtown east side might not work. <laughs> so the combined service of the downtown east side churches, and uh, she talked about her work with 24-7 prayer. So I don't feel like I really need to introduce um, that work with you, but um, Jenny also is very involved in this neighborhood as in her work with 24-7. So she walks the streets and prays in these streets. And, and I, you know, when I head down to Maine and Hastings, I feel like I, I don't walk that area terribly much. But when I walk there, I so often feel like I, I bump into you. And yeah. you know all the neighbors <laughs> down there. It's, it's just amazing. It's great. Plus, Jenny knows all the great coffee shops of this neighborhood, <laughs> I think. And so if you want to know some really cool um, coffee shops in the Chinatown and the downtown east side neighborhood, Talk with Jenny. So I'm going to pray for Jenny too, and uh, uh, and then I'm also going to take a moment to set up my camera. So just if you wouldn't mind giving me or just giving us a little bit of time and having a bit of patience with us. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that it is through you that we are united, united with the churches around the downtown east side here, across Vancouver, across BC and Canada, and around the world. And thank you that we have the privilege here in uh, Vancouver, at sort of the end of the dateline, to sort of gather up the praises and the worship and the, the glory that uh, we are meant to give you um, from the whole of the day. And, and we get to kind of wrap that up here in Vancouver. And, and so we pray that you would be with Jenny as she speaks to us about prayer, as, uh, as we hear um, you speak to us through this um, amazing text from the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, would you just give Jenny a deep sense of your pleasure, of confidence and joy, even though she just gets to speak in a sense to an audience of two um, here as Sandra and I. Are here and as all of us are now gathered through this technology lord help us to focus give us give us the ability to just really hear what you want to say to us even though we're, we're sitting in front of our computers we ask this in the strong the good the saving name of our lord and friend jesus amen i'm going to start with an excerpt of a poem what is the vision the vision is holiness that hurts the eyes. It makes children laugh and adults angry. It gave up the game of minimum integrity long ago to reach for the stars. It scorns for the good and strains for the best. It is dangerous, dangerously pure. Light flickers from every secret motive, every private conversation. It loves people away from their suicide leaps, their Satan games. This is an army that will lay down its life for the cause. A million times a day, its soldiers choose to lose that might, they might one day win the great well done of faithful sons and daughters. Such heroes are as radical on Monday morning as Sunday night. They don't need fame from names. Instead, they grin quietly upwards and hear the crowds chanting again and again, come on! So as we've already established you probably recognize me from the the combined service of the downtown east side talking about prayer um, that's usually what i talk about when my face shows up on screen um, and i think last time during the combined service i told you a little bit about how i came to be a part of 24 7 prayer but i don't know if i shared much about the origin story of 24 7 prayer so i want to do that very briefly before i move into the actual beef of this sermon but 24-7 prayer is a network, a global prayer community that started at the turn of the millennium in 1999 with a group of students in the UK who knew that they were bad at prayer and that that was not 
a good thing. <laughs> we're like, we're, we're Christians and this is such a core part of our spiritual life. And yet we don't know how to pray and connect with God. So what should we do about this? Um, and they decided to do a bit of a social experiment. Um, they had a warehouse, they found an empty warehouse, set up a prayer room and decided for an entire week, they were gonna pray around the clock in that space and see what happened. And they were very pleasantly surprised when God showed up in that space. What they learned was when they intentioned their time and their schedules and their presence to be in a space that was meant for prayer, in community that God would show up in a really powerful way. And it's, it lasted, um, it went beyond the week. They went into the second week and then more people heard about it and it went into the third week. Um, and it became a viral thing. <laughs> like, it spread quite quickly. So this little bit of poem that I started out with is actually from one of the very first prayer rooms um, that was found on one of the prayer walls. I came across 24-7 prayer about 15 years ago. My cousin's MySpace page had this poem on it. And I remember reading it and just kind of stopping in my tracks like, oh, that's so interesting. Where's that from? So I did some research, found out about 24-7 prayer and was so amazed that there was a group of Christians that were wanting to live in such a sacri sacrificial way that the world had no grip on them. Um, and I hadn't experienced that in my church upbringing up until that point. And so something lit a fire inside of me. The Holy Spirit lit a fire inside of me. And I said, that's the way that I want to live. So since then, there have been prayer rooms that have been established throughout the world, often in communities that are unchurched. Um, sometimes prayer rooms would be set up in nightclubs, slum hotels, punk festivals, and the church. <laughs> The church as well. In Canada, 24-7 prayer exists to help churches and organizations cultivate a deep and comprehensive culture of prayer. Mission and justice as well that impacts the cultures around us. And I'm really passionate about speaking to churches about prayer, so I'm so grateful that you invited me today. Um, just really quickly how I got involved. I moved to the neighborhood 10, 11 years ago. Um, I learned about the movement through the poem and I was working at a nonprofit, but I was very much on the periphery of what 24 seven prayer was doing. Um, but about seven years in, I felt a really strong call from God that I needed to leave my job and do full-time ministry in the neighborhood. Um, it was really scary. I have, I've been a Christian my entire life, but I have these certain points in my life where I call them come to Jesus moments where I realized that I'm not living into the full, fullest potential of what God has planned for me. Um, and so this was one of those moments and it really was a moment. I quit my job, ran out of my workplace to find a place where I could just process and weep. Um, and in that literal moment, I heard three words, be the church. And I was very confused <laughs> because I felt like, well, I, I guess I am the church already, but that doesn't really make sense. What do you mean by that, God? And from that moment on, um, there was a process of really discerning and wrestling with what my calling was, what God was inviting me into. Um, and he gracefully provided for six months of sabbatical time for me. <laughs> So I wasn't working for six months and had enough money for rent and food and everything else, which was really amazing. And in that time, I started realizing that I wanted to work for all of the churches in downtown Eastside, Strathcona and Chinatown, but I had no idea how to do that or if there was even a position for that. And at one moment, one time I was talking with Aaron White, who was the leader of 24 seven prayer at the time. And he said, what are you doing with your time? I know you're not working at Mission Possible anymore. Um, and so I just told him, I was like, I want to work for all the churches. And he's like, oh, that's interesting because 24 seven prayer is going to open a prayer room for all of the churches in the neighborhood. Why don't you join us? And it took all of two seconds for me to be like, yes, I'm in. Um, so the Lord very graciously ushered me into this way of life. Um, and I'm so thankful for it. I've been, I've been learning over the past five or six years what Be the Church means in very practical ways in terms of living in the downtown east side, but also just learning to love my brothers and sisters in Christ well. 
The title of this sermon is called Pouring Out, because if I've learned anything from cultivating a lifestyle of intentional prayer, whether it's myself as an individual or with my community, it's that prayer absolutely is a sacrifice, that there is a sacrifice involved when we pour ourselves out to God. I don't know if you guys know of Brother Lawrence. He is a 17th century monk who is known for his writings. There's this little book called Practicing the Presence of God. And um, it's just a little punchy book. And he talks about um, holding, like, holding an awareness of God's presence through the most mundane tasks of your day. So you could be washing the dishes and like knowing that God is with you in that time. He says this, I cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth of the center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing, but the least turning from him is insupportable. This morning, I'm going to read two stories in Mark 14 that I believe speak to the cost and the value of living in this way. We've read the first story already, so I'm going to start with another one that maybe you guys have talked about, I don't know. Um, Mark 14, 3 through 6. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and given to the poor. You could donate that money to UGM and feed so many people. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. I really, um, I love this, this passage. Um, and I'm going off script a little here, but I, I have a friend who's trying to get into detox right now. And one of her favorite worship songs in entirety is a song called pour out um for you i pour it out for you i pour it out for you for you i pour it out to you and it's called praise like oil and every time i read this passage i think of my friend who has had the most incredibly difficult life and yet still her sacrifices in the midst of her her pain and knowing that life is not right that she can pour all of that out to jesus and receive all the love that he has for her. This woman, my friend, <laughs> but also this woman in the passage, gave a prayer, an embodied prayer of adoration to Jesus. Adoration, respect, honor. It was very cultural in that time to anoint your guest with oil. I don't think it was cultural to douse your guest in perfume. <laughs> and yet this is what she did and her action was pitted against the value systems of economy and charity you could have used this money for the poor and yet you wasted it you see value systems which are systems that establish values norms or goals existing in a society um, value systems can be family financial security political ideologies i'm from the states and that's a very strong value system in my family. Um, even religion can be a value system in terms of moralistic thinking and what we feel like we have to do to attain a certain level in our Christianity. None of these things are bad, especially not family, financial security. So there's nothing wrong with these things. In fact, I think that humans need structure and systems and codes to live well with each other. But the value systems are not made to keep, like, we're not made for the value systems. Um, and so I believe that sometimes we really have to, like, God is asking us to shift our priorities and see things in the way that he sees him, 
sees them instead of the ways that we assume they should roll out. One of my strongest value systems is productivity. So even in the crafting of the sermon for the last three weeks, I had so many interruptions and they were all relational and they were all incredibly important. And so, so many little moments of the Holy Spirit saying to me like, oh, this is what I want to say to you through this relationship. Like this works into prayer and sacrifice. And yet if I was under the value system of productivity, I would have just shut those conversations down. I've been like, nope, got to go to my, my room or my office and do my own thing. And yet the Holy Spirit invites us into so much more than what we can see. A discipline of prayer can come at the cost of our time, our finances, our agendas, and even our dignity. And I add in dignity there because when I think about forgiveness, it sometimes feels like if God's asking you to forgive someone. It's like you're giving up your dignity because you're backing away from the thing that you feel wronged by. That also came up this week. The sacrifice of giving up these value systems leads to something that is so much greater. It's that reorientation that I just talked about of our hearts to Jesus. Being a person of prayer looks foolish almost always <laughs> because often what God's asks, what God will ask us to do flies in the face of worldly logic, but not godly logic. And yet we are called as a church to be people who are different, a people who focus on the one who sustains us. When you spend time with Jesus in prayer, thanksgiving, adoration, you're going to start to smell like him. And that's a good thing to smell like Christ. The second story that I want to read is one that we just went over. Mark 14, 30 to 32 to 42. So I'm going to read it again. And as I read it, maybe, maybe close your eyes, get into a contemplative space and be attentive to any, any pouring out themes or sacrificial themes that you might notice. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. I wonder um, in that reading, I can't see the chat because the camera's facing me, but if you noticed anything that might be very topical to pouring out themes, if you could write it in the chat, um, that would be great. I also wonder, and, and this is a deeply emotional thought for me, I hope it's theologically sound, we'll see. Um, if you've ever considered that even for a moment, Jesus, Jesus's flesh got in the way of the will of God, of what God wanted him to do. That even for a moment, Jesus didn't want to die a brutal death, didn't want to experience his friends completely abandoning him, didn't want to lose that connection with his father. Even though he knew the master plan, he knew that it had to be done. He knew that his death was the ultimate sacrifice that would pour out 
to many for ages to come. And I also wonder that if Jesus's admonition to his disciples for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And also I'll insert, couldn't you keep watch for one and one hour should perhaps be the theme for 24 seven prayer rooms everywhere because we sign up for one hour time slots. Um, I wonder if he was not talking about himself in that moment, as well as the disciples. Was Jesus even experiencing this tension between the value systems of the world and self-preservation and God's value system and God's plan for the entire world? When I, when I came across this meditation, I just kind of dropped everything. <laughs> it was like, whoa, I don't know. That's crazy. But I wonder. I also find it really interesting that it was the place that Jesus was praying in that was very significant. And we know all through Jesus's ministry, after speaking to the masses, he would always go away and be alone or with a few people and connect with his father in a deep way. It was this familiar place to retreat to that gives that intentionality, gives us a hint that intentionality of prayer is important. And I think also that place gave him the space to be able to pour out his agony and his distress to God in order for God to pour into him the courage to be able to do the thing that he called him to do. Gethsemane actually means oil press. An oil press crushes the olives and makes them into olive oil. Um, I've actually been to the garden, what is perceived as the Garden of Gethsemane in East Jerusalem. Um, and there's some gigantic olive trees there. It's pretty cool. The scent of the woman's perfume would have lingered on Jesus's skin as he prayed to his father, pleading that he too would not have to be poured out. And yet knowing that salvation could only happen, could not happen without his willing sacrifice. And so then he says, not my will, but your will be done, Father. The cost of prayer. Like the olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would be crushed. His life poured out for so many. In Mark 14, 24, there's another pouring scripture. Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. When he's doing the communion at the Last Supper with his disciples. So, dear church, <laughs> it feels like a heavy word, but it's so good. Receive the invitation to fall into step with your creator. Or as Brother Lawrence says, keep yourself retired with him in the depth of the center of your soul as much as you can. Sacrifice leads to fragrance, whether it's a burnt offering and it smells like barbecue, olives crushed into oil, perfume poured out, or a reorientation of the heart towards the will of God. People will notice it. Thank you. Amen. Bless you, Jenny. Thank you so much. I think what we're going to do, and I meant to say this before I, we started, is we'll do the song of response. And then that will give you some time to maybe you have a question or a response to Jenny. And Jenny will take your questions after the song of response.
Thank you so much, Emily, for leading us this morning. And again, thank you, Jenny, too, for, for speaking to us. That was so good. I wish you could all have been in this holy space here this morning. I know that your place in front of the computer is also a holy space, but ah, uh, yeah, it, uh, thank you for speaking to me. Uh, you know, in the prayers of the people, we have a prayer for Patty, or remembering Patty, who died a week ago today. And Patty is a fixture in this neighborhood. You know Patty, I'm sure. And, and I have to admit, I, I often try to avoid her because she could get very upset. We had, had conversations here in front of the, the uh, um, in front of the porch here and, and in front of our place. And she lived just on our block. So, mm -hmm. so we met her a lot. And, and I've just felt myself deeply grieving. And I just wonder about how, I guess so I'm going to, that will be my first question. I mean, it feels to me like grief is also, this grief for the world can also be a pouring out. I think I'm grieving because I could have been so much more for Patty. I could have tried to push through some of that crustiness mm -hmm. of her and some of the deep pain that she had um, here. But uh, and so maybe some of my grief is just wishing I would have been more poured out for her, but also for this person who had suffered so much abuse. Okay, sorry, I'll quit talking. I, I meant to ask you a question. And maybe, maybe you want to respond to some of that on the chat or just how grief is also pouring out. Yeah. Can you guys hear me all right? We're good? Okay. Um, yeah. One of the things that I was going to talk about, but then I was like, oh, maybe this is too much, <laughs> was that this time last year, um, we had a prayer. I think we had a prayer week from January 1 to 8, but it was difficult because it was very much in the midst of COVID where people didn't want to meet in person, and so most people prayed from their homes. Um, and the prayer room was set up, but it, I think it was used by people that lived on the block for the most part. Um, and I, I signed up because I designed it. <laughs> um, and I was there. And for the first three hours of being there, all I could do was just weep and grieve and cry. And I was so mad at God and I hadn't given myself the space and the time and the permission to voice my all of these disappointments to the Lord and the grief and like the hardships that I was going through. And it honestly felt like <laughs> there was no better place to do that except in the place of prayer. Like it could not have happened anywhere else. And through that time, I felt exhausted, <laughs> but also like, no, this is how God met me. Like this is how God needed to meet me in this place and in this time. And I think that's why I connect so deeply to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus's grief, right? And right. knowing what he's about to go through mm -hmm. um, and knowing that that's absolutely a legitimate way to connect with God and go deeper. Um, and sometimes, yeah. Mm. And I think especially being in this community, um, it's, I almost feel like we need to schedule ourselves time to do that. Yes, lament and grieve. Yeah, yeah. but not just in the downtown east side. Like, yeah. everyone goes through yeah. these situations. Thank you, Jenny. Any questions? Anybody? Just unmute yourself. And uh, um, anybody have a question for Jenny? Yes, I will be first. <laughs> Jenny, you um, mentioned a couple of times how <clears throat> um, when you pray around the clock, um, how God um, met you uh, or how God um, basically was there and, you know, God answered prayers, God, et cetera. Can you share with us some examples of how God came through? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was referring to different weeks of prayer that we've had in the past. And I think that, um, like, so I, I work for 24 seven prayer and people assume I pray 24 seven all the time. And I wish that were true. <laughs> I wish I were like a complete saint in that aspect, but I'm not. But when we're actually doing weeks of prayer and there's an accountability and I know other people are gonna be in that space and bringing their prayers to the Lord 
and we're doing it in community, it just feels like heaven is so much closer, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and I remember specific times, like I've um, invited several people into that space because I do a lot of outreach as well and I love bringing people alongside. And so I would sign up for a prayer shift and bring a friend in and all of a sudden, as we were praying or like going through the different stations, all of this stuff would just come out like this, this vulnerability and this um, cry to like want God to move in their lives that we've never been able to reach that place before together in just normal conversation. And so seeing breakthrough and personal relationships in that way was a huge, a huge theme that I see all the time, actually, when we're doing weeks of prayer. Um, and I think also, um, yeah, honestly, there's like too many stories of God's provision to even like come up with one specific one. But um, I just, yeah, <laughs> the stories are whirling in my mind and I'm not sure which one to nail down. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, for prayer, uh, there was a acronym I was uh, taught very early on in my Christian walk, uh, ACTS, Adoration, Confession, uh, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Do you have uh, such a structure, uh, Jenny? Um, so sometimes I'll go through different liturgies or I'll, I'll do devotionals and there's, with 24 seven prayer, we use the acronyms PRAY. And so I believe it stands for pause, rest, ask, and yield, um, which is honestly kind of the natural way that we pray anyways, if you think about it. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes that's helpful for me to lead me through and guide me, especially when I'm doing stuff in the morning, just getting started with my day and I want to take a minute to pause and um, recognize where God is in my day. There's, um, I've heard this quote thrown around many times that I think someone, someone from 21st Sovereign Prayer said it at one point, and it's that when we spend one hour in our day just reorienting ourselves to God, that might not even be the prayer. It might just be that heart posture. And then the rest of the day, we're acting in this prayerful way of like, you have, you have a conversation that bothers you, and so you take it in prayer to God, or someone looks at you weird and it might like unsettle you and nope, you take that in prayer to God. Or you hear news of a friend like Patty passing away and your instant response is to take it in prayer. And that can only happen if we're orienting ourselves daily to mm. the Lord. And I'll just add on, in the Timbits this week, I'm going to include the 24 seven prayer guide. Tuesday is the beginning of the International Week of Prayer yes, for Christian right. Unity. So we'll include that, and, and in there is the PRAY, that yeah. acronym. So there's another one to add to your, um, to your arsenal. That's not quite the right word, but to the group of uh, ways to pray, um, Pam. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, I'll ask an easy one for you, Jenny. I mean, um, do, you, do you feel like, um, you mentioned earlier on people wanted to be, pray better. Do you feel you get better as you go along? Not that you get perfect, I suppose, but do you feel get, you get better? Or is it more like um, up and down? You know, you, you, you sometimes wonder, hey, I'm, I'm even more backwards than I was years ago or <laughs> something like that. Good question. Yeah. Um, when I'm in practice, I do feel like I'm, I'm, I don't know if better is the right word, but more connected for sure. Um, and I notice when I'm not keeping with this practice of prayer and like really being disciplined with it because I can become quite scattered. <laughs> I'm a bit of a daydreamer and so I can become very scattered and overwhelmed with small things if I'm not intentional with my prayer discipline. And so I think that's a big thing of what I mean by the sacrifice, the, the cost of prayer and like what we give up and what we think that we're 
supposed to hold on to that's not actually that important. And the value of what we get from that is so much greater in terms of like knowing that God resides in that inner core of ourselves um, and allowing that to guide us through the week. So that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. All right. Well, I, we, I guess we could have time for one more. I see, Lydia, you asked for that poem from your, the beginning. And so if you could share that with me, I'll yeah, include yeah. it in the okay. Timbits as well. For sure. And thanks for that request. Anybody else yet? One more quick one uh, for Jenny. And then after that, we'll turn it over to Tim to lead us in the prayers of the people and the mission of the church. I don't have another question, but I just want to say that um, thank you, Jenny, for this great reminder. And really, um, your life is an example and uh, a lesson for us in prayer. If I could ask a quick question, then the different um, the value of individual prayer by yourself when you're praying, and then corporate prayer, even if it's just one person or maybe two or three others. Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, both and Nelson. <laughs> I know um, I have a lot of prayer meetings throughout the week, and I can't tell you how many times I feel like, oh, I'm I'm really tired. I can't go to this prayer meeting. <laughs> I need to rest. And then I just force myself to do it. And I'm so edified by the body of Christ that the, the corporate prayer totally feeds into the individual prayer. Like they're intertwined. And it's so encouraging. And that's why I'm so passionate about talking to the church in general about prayer, because we need each other in this practice. It's Yes, it's between you and God, but it's also... It's like, I think I heard it said, like, there's the, the vertical, like, between me and God, but then there's a lateral, me and, like, everyone else, the body of Christ, and it intersects those two. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me pronounce, send you off with a benediction, but again, don't feel like you need to be sent off right away. <clears throat> Go now in the confidence that God's love has been, is being, and will be poured out on you. And we know this because Jesus' own life blood has been poured out. And we look forward to celebrating communion, communion next Sunday together and the pouring out of his life, his very life, his body broken, his blood poured out for us. And may you know in this coming week the spirit of power and life poured out into your, your life, into our community, and then out through you, poured out, so that we will be well, the fragrance, the perfume the world desperately needs here. May you go to be a costly sacrifice for our beautiful, broken world. Amen. Go in peace to love Amen. and serve the world.